Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to see everyone here. Sorry for the bit of the delay, but um, I'm sure it's going to be worth it because I have three amazing wines in front of me from Ovid, as well as Austin Peterson, uh, winemaker. So thanks for waiting. Um, this is the Wine Access Experience on Facebook. Uh, we've been using this to, um, to stay connected, um, to continue the conversations about wine, get to know the people behind them, uh, even in virtual tastings. So, um, so thanks again. My name is Vanessa Conlon, Head of Wine for Wine Access. Um, your background, Austin, looks um, a little different than mine. I'm actually in my den. <laughs> If that's your done, I'm very jealous, but I have a feeling you are you're actually uh, on top of Pritchard Hill at, at the winery and it uh, looks like a looks like a, a beautiful day to be up there. So thank you so much for for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Great. For yeah. So um, again, everyone at home, sorry for the delay, but um, I'm really excited to have you here at the Wine Access Experience. Uh, so uh, I'm here with uh, Austin Peterson, winemaker for Ovid. Um, sitting high atop uh, the beautiful Pritchard Hill. We're gonna taste a couple wines, but um, Austin, uh, speaking of uh, Pritchard Hill, I, I have a question for you. Uh, Pritchard Hill is, is not an, an AVA or an American viticultural area. Uh, do you think that it should be? Um, you know, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, I think that the valley, you know, we have the AVAs and the pretty broad strokes, if, if we're honest about uh, about that. And what's really fascinating and a lot of fun in Napa right now is to start to understand really all the little pieces of it. So, um, you know, we're making Bordeaux varieties, but we have kind of a Burgundian mindset in terms of how the valley is divided up. So there's a lot of evolution there, um, but uh, it's hard to say exactly whether Pritchard Hill should be an AVA in and of itself at the moment. Got it. Well, it's certainly a, a distinctive and respected region. Um, so it's an honor to taste these these wines tonight. And so uh, from what I read um, and understand, Ovid is named for a Roman poet famed for writing uh, The Metamorphoses, uh, which is a, a, a retelling of mythology celebrating themes of transformation and change. So I'm wondering about those two words, transformation and change, in terms of how you and the rest of the team at Ovid uh, approach winemaking? Yeah, well, I mean, just to start, we are, by definition, uh, all nerds up here for sure, uh, being a name for our own poet. Um, <laughs> we think of transformation and change as uh, not only just grapes being changed from uh, fruit into wine and something kind of, but preserving and savoring uh, the season that was, um, but also the process of transformation and change in our understanding of what this place is, what these wines want to be, and really uh, pursuing the very best expression of what this place can do or can provide. So do you, um, in terms of your own personal philosophy to winemaking then, when you start a harvest, let's say, are you, are you approaching everything kind of with fresh eyes? Or are there things that you sort of apply year after year that you found is sort of your tried and true uh, formula, if you will? Um, you know, my, my dad, who's also a winemaker, always told me that uh, great winemaking is constant experimentation. And uh, so I, I take that approach, I take that to heart, and it's some of the best advice he gave me. And, um, and so every year there's, there's always something new that we're trying. There's always, uh, different ideas. There's always things that we want to research and understand. Um, and we're never really satisfied until we've kind of, you know, we've really played in that sandbox and understood, okay, this is how this works. And now we, we feel confident we have that, that piece of the puzzle ironed out and we're moving on to the next one. But given that wine is such a com complex, um, uh, complex thing, it, it, you know, there's just endless uh, questions to ask. So, you know, there's some parts of the harvest uh, do stay the same, but there's, I mean, last year as an example, it, it, there wasn't a single thing that we did the same way as the previous year. So yeah, constant change really. Got it. Um, so I have um, the white wine here, uh, 2018 vintage of the experiment. So uh, it has kind of a fascinating uh, cepage. So eight, eight varieties, Sauvignon Blanc, 
Viognier, Albarino, Roussan, Vermentino, Pique Pou Blanc, Grenache Blanc, and Marsan. Uh, I'm I'm fascinated and excited to try this. But the first thing I thought when I just you know looked at the label and saw this um, this sort of uh, mix of of different uh, of different varieties is some of these I think of as being sort of more more like crisp, lean, high acid. You know, Sauvignon Blanc, Albarino, Pique Pool, and some of these I think of being sort of more plush and round in nature. You know, Marsan, Roussan, Grenache Blanc. So. How do you think that those varieties play um, in harmony, and what made you decide to use those specific ones? Yeah, well, I mean, fortunately, it's on the front label, so I can remember what all these things are. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, this started for us back in '14, and I should say that this is part of our experiment series. So we have the Ovid and, and its amateur wines, the flagships of of the estate, and then uh, we have an experiment series that is all you know just all over the board any idea that we're pursuing anything that we find interesting you know mm -hmm. the reds are focused on the estate and the white um is the you know the opportunity to make a white wine came up back in uh 2014 and we, we you know we we're out of wine we saw people coming to visit us at the winery and you know, it was kind of an awkward situation we didn't have anything to sell um and so as much as we love pouring our friends white wines and and uh at dinners we thought ah, it'd be fun to have a, a white of our own. Um, and so this is really just taking the idea of, you know, what is a, a great California white wine and, and throwing out the rule book. So yeah. uh, we started out with, uh, in 14, with Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon and Viognier and Roussan, so two classic pairs. Uh, but the link between the two pairs being a classic description of Tarantis, which is a white grape uh, grown in Argentina, and that description is always Viognier and Sauvignon Blanc blended together. And so we thought, well, mm -hmm. you know, there might be something there. And given that California grows so many things uh, so well, we thought it'd be really fun to kind of explore that, pull that thread and see where it goes. So in 14, it was just a barrel of Sauvignon Blanc, a barrel of Viognier, a barrel of Roussan, all blended together. Um, and then Curiosity is just run amok. So this is uh, a variety. <laughs> basically something that's coming from all over the state and uh, we've slowly added these pieces as we found really interesting growers, really interesting vineyards uh, that we want to work with and uh, that are, are places that are going to teach us something. And in the process, yeah. we want to explore what uh, we feel is a great, you know, what a great California white wine can be. Um, so the idea and the intention with this wine is to make something that has, that doesn't deny that it's from California, that we have all the sunshine, um, and it has that richness uh, that um, that this state provides, that this place provides, uh, but it also maintains that freshness, that vibrancy, that um, yeah. uh, uh, minerality is just kind of the, the um, acidity that we love from uh, European wines. So, trying to take the best, you know, the, the kind of guiding lights of, of what you see in Europe and apply that to California. And, you know, you maybe have to apply that in an unconventional way, but copy and paste does not necessarily work. Um, so, curious. <laughs> it's fa it's a fascinating wine. I mean, it, there really is nothing quite like it. Um, so, of the the you know that those eight different varieties that we mentioned, is there one that you really love working with, and one that drives you absolutely nuts? <laughs> um, yeah, all of them. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what I love about it is that you get to, uh, I mean, this is a red wine house, but it, we get to play with a little half ton of this and a couple rows of that all over. So I love the the conversations that this this project starts and, and what it makes you think about. And it also drives you crazy because it makes you think about and makes you question everything that you do. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, in terms of the varieties, I'd say that the Albarino is a really fascinating variety in California. I think it has, it makes some absolutely wonderful wines. Um, yeah. And I think that there's, uh, if anyone that's ever tried to press any of the Rhone varieties can, you know, express their frustration. It's like trying to squeeze Jello through a, a colander. <laughs> it's, it's great, it's just so tough. Um, but the wines are the biggest stuff. Uh, yeah. It's a, every every year is an adventure. Yeah. Well, so we have a question from home. So Armen, hello, Armen. Um, once is asking, is there a ninth wine varietal that you wanted to use? 
Um, well, you know, if we make, I should pull up the labeling of it. If we add a ninth, we're going to have to extend the label. Or <laughs> <gonna> <laughs> Um, but we might be adding uh, some Ebola for 2020. So um, it's the the Italian varieties seem to really kind of have that freshness and vibrancy. The northern um, yeah. uh, Spanish varieties are, have that. Um, so it is it is definitely thinking about those you know that kind of band that area and, and thinking about what those might bring. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, you know, maybe we'll have 10 varieties in 2020. It's kind of, uh, any, anything goes. So um, yeah, just, uh, you know, put, put it in the budget that you need a new label, then you can do whatever you want. Yeah, it's gonna wrap <laughs> all around. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. like Perfect, it works. So um, I, I actually forgot to ask you, um, which of the reds you wanted to to start with? Uh, what should I pour first? Yeah, you know, so these are they're two very different expressions of, of uh, expressions of the estate, but um, you know, we, we consider them equal. Uh, we think of them equally. So uh, we can start with the hexameter. So okay, and thank you for saying that first because I wanted to ask you ahead of time if I was correct in my pronunciation. I forgot so. I was gonna yeah. I was gonna trick you into saying it anyway before I had to, but thank you. Okay, so it's a hexameter. Yeah, hexameter. Uh, I mean hexameter, hex, hexameter, Ovid, Ovid. As long as you're saying it, we're happy. Um, but <laughs> uh, we say hexameter uh, around the winery and we say Ovid okay. around the winery. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so hexameters are franc dominant uh, blend. Um, and it's actually really a direct product of that experimentation line. So our very first experiment, sorry, just to jump into this, but, um, yeah, I, I love this wine. Um, so, um, so it gets me off and running, no problem. Um, uh, but it, the very first experiment wine we made back in 2005 was Cabernet Franc with a hefty dose of Petit Verdot. Uh, and we did that because those, that wine was just absolutely, you know, those wines as varietals in the vineyard for, uh, were just absolutely incredible and we absolutely loved it. So once we made the Ovid blend, we had, you know, as you're doing that, you're thinking about things in barrel quantities. Um, and so there's always a limiting factor there. So you're using you know, three out of five of this lot, two out of four out of this lot. And so we had this Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot that was left over and we looked at each other and said, oh, there's no way that we can give us, you know, sell this off to someone else. Um, let's make an unconventional blend. So that, that became the first experiment wine and started this, you know, that uh, series for us that's asking all these questions and trying all these weird things. Um, but the, the benefit of that wine uh, is that we absolutely loved it and uh, it gave us the confidence to use a lot of Cabernet Franc in our wines going forward. So we use a lot more Cabernet Franc in the Ovid blend going forward. And then in 2009, finally said, okay, we need to make a kind of Franc dominant blend that's at the same level as Ovid. So um, that was 2009, and then we didn't do it again until 2012, and we've kind of been on a steady run uh, ever since. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'm a huge fan of Cabernet Franc, uh, as are many of the people that that I work with, and um, I uh, I always you know, I, it pains me sometimes that I feel like it's not as beloved by consumers from Napa Valley as, as Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but for me, I mean, it's, it's such an, has such an elegance, such a perfume, such a gracefulness on the palate it can still be, you know, beautifully full bodied and, and structured, but there's just something so seductive about it. And, uh, I, I absolutely love this wine, but to, to you know, to, to sort of tackle that question, like if you were going to talk to a consumer about, you know, who just loves Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley, you know, how would you describe um, the differences between Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc and, you know, why should they pay attention? Sure. Um, you know, kind of getting back to the ADA question and our understanding of what Napa is like and what Napa does well. Uh, Cabernet Franc has gotten such a bad wrap in the valley over the years because it used to get planted in the heavy play soils and it would be green and vigorous and tannic and just didn't make good wines and as we've come to understand that you want to plant Cabernet Franc in the rocks um, and that has made it just uh, absolutely sing in Napa. 
And so uh, while Cabernet Sauvignon has more of kind of the, the really dark fruits, like the, the blackberry and cassis and mulberry, Cabernet Franc has a little bit more of the like violets and yeah. um, like if you ever had violet candies, it has plenty yes. of that, a little bit of sage, a little bit of that bay leaf, um, a little bit more of like boysenberry rather than blackberry. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's so perfumed, just so delicious uh, that yeah. Uh, if you like Cabernet Sauvignon, you should really do yourself a favor and try Cabernet Franc uh, from yeah. uh, the modern era. It's so, so good. I I couldn't agree. Um, AJ from Wine Access, I don't know if you're watching, but you would love this wine. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, before before we talk um, more about um, the wines, I actually I wanted to just go back to a question for you personally. So, um, I think you've worked harvest in, if I'm right, correct me if I'm not, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, South Africa, and France. So I'm yeah. curious, uh, are any of those regions? Did you did you sort of learn something distinctive from any of those that you've now applied to your winemaking here in Napa Valley? Yeah. You know, that was, um, that was great. I was essentially, for those that aren't familiar with the, the wine industry, you know, it's, or, uh, the wine harvest it happens once a year up here. It happens, uh, once a year, uh, in the Southern hemisphere and it's six months apart. So, uh, it's common for, um, people getting into the wine industry when you're early in your career to go work both hemispheres and get two harvests in per year, get, you know, kind of build your experience. And, uh, so I was really enjoying being at a harvest bum for a couple of years and I'd go work a harvest somewhere and then I'd take the money I earned during harvest and travel that quarter another globe and then go down to the next, you know, the southern hemisphere and do the same thing. And um, the beauty of that was really uh, not only do you get to see winemaking at different scales, but you also get to see the winemaking and culturally. And what, you know, what does that wine mean? Why, why is, how does a wine fit into that culture? Why do they make that wine and why do they make it in that way? Um, and then technically you get to see it from a lot of different sides. So all of those things were really, you know, all those experiences were really informative to me. Um, working in Palmer Wall, you obviously had both Merlot and Cabernet Franc and, and um, mm -hmm. that was incredibly educational. Um, and then uh, seeing that, you know, comparing that with making Cabernet Franc in South Africa six months later was a uh, in a wildly different setup that was going from working at the uh, Michelle Laurent's estate in, in Palmerol to working in an old dynamite factory on the beach in, in South Africa um, yeah. and getting air front from all over the kitchen. So um, that broadness, broadness of exposure um, allows me to really kind of make much more detailed and nuanced decisions now that we're here. So you know, every vintage yeah. presents its own challenges and its own um, uh, uh, puzzles to unravel, and uh, if you have a broader palette to pull from, it, it, it really helps to um, make the best decisions you can. Is there any region um, where you haven't made wine, where if you could, uh, you know, convince your uh, your team there to let you go for a harvest, uh, where you would like to go make wine? Um, I think my boss is listening, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Honestly, you know, the in that process of being that little uh, the uh, harvest bum um, and basically backpacking around the world making wine, it was working at, at places that were making 500 cases and making and places that were making two million cases and really everywhere in between. So mm -hmm. the curiosity for me is is huge in terms of um, all the different places that are making wine. I'd love to go work in Italy, and Spain, and China. And, India and um, Chile, you know, it's a, the list yeah. is, is incredibly long. It's just because uh, every place has a different take and um, that perspective and that diversity of perspective is so interesting to me. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a long list, but uh, probably not. <laughs> I'll go visit. <laughs> <laughs> so I hate to, um, Push, push this glass aside because I'm I'm absolutely uh, in love with it. But I'm going to pour the um, the 2016 Ovid. So um, sure. this has a lot of um, words on it that I'm not going to try to pronounce. Um, <laughs> but this, <laughs> partly we recovered the old familiar things, partly created something wondrous and new. 
So I guess my question is, what about this um, is old and familiar, and what about it is, is wondrous and new? Um, you know, that really speaks to the, the mentality that we have uh, here at the winery. And so, um, you know, this was basically, this was raw land before we developed it, planted a vineyard and, built, and then built the winery here. And uh, the, the old familiar things, uh, was really the, the fact that you know we, we did plant Bordeaux varieties here, which is and uh, with a granted a healthy dose of Cabernet Franc, but it's predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon um, or majority Cabernet Sauvignon, I should say, planted. Um, and so that piece is is kind of tried and true. That's old and familiar. We also have concrete tanks, uh, which were really poured in place. Um, so very much and basically taking the inspiration and actually the the same masons that built Petrus's cellar. Um, to help us build our cellar, um, wow. and so we and we use you know a lot of of, um, of classical techniques in our winemaking. So um, so so that you know those things are are kind of the old and the uh, and familiar. Um, but the wondrous and new is really the fact that this is new land, and with that you yeah. don't know what's going to work best until you really try lots of different things. So this that attitude of constant experimentation and constant improvement is really uh, what drives us each and every day. So we're making wine, we're making wine in, in very traditional ways, but we're also driving ourselves to make those, that wine better and better. And we're doing that through this really uh, new approach, um, that could even be yeah. a new approach each year. So. Uh, so I, um, I think I read that the winery is um, gravity fed. It is. So can you, um, can you explain, you know, for those maybe at home, like, um, what that like why one would do that and then i'd love to just hear your thoughts on like what does that impart or not impart uh to the wines yeah um well gravity so gravity flow basically is meaning that we take the fruit from the vineyard um we process it on our, our or sort through it on our um, fresh bag uh, and then we will take that fruit and we pour it very gently into the top of it uh, through the top of the tank and you know, being on a hillside, um, as you can see behind us, that's Napa or Napa Valley. Um, being on a hillside, uh, you really want to try and take advantage of that gravity flow. So it's it's helpful um, during harvest because we break everything during harvest, and gravity is really hard to break. Uh, so we. Uh, <laughs> um, but the, the real benefit to us is that it preserves the the quality of the fruit. So we're not. Um, basically sorting through the fruit on our sorting line and getting these perfect little grapes or, or you know, it looks like a, a boat full of blueberries at the, at the end of it. Um, and then we're not taking that and then pumping it through a line and sh basically shearing the skins and breaking it up um, on the, in the way to get uh, to the tank. What we're doing instead is it comes off that into a boat uh, or you know, like a stainless um, boat or bowl, I guess. Uh, and then we'll take that and just with the forklift go and tip that into the top of the tank uh, really gently. So the fruit is getting from the room to the tank in as pristine a condition as possible. Um, and then that allows us to really, kind of, we don't have any freezing, we don't have any oxidation, we don't have anything that's, I uh, don't have excessive tannins straight away. It uh, allows us to have a nice, easy fermentation. So yeah. uh, a lot of benefits to it uh, if you can do it. Okay. So, um, Austin, I have a, a question back to just to you um, personally as a winemaker. But is you know, is there one person you can um, you can point to who was the most influential to you in terms of your winemaking? Ooh, um, the most is kind of hard to say. To be honest, uh, I think that the yeah. various folks in, in in my career have been influential in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, obviously, uh, working for Michelle in, in France and then uh, having him as a consultant here, um, I've learned a ton about blending and vineyard management from him. Um, uh, having grown up with John Consgard and my, my father, uh, and John Consgard was really influential to me and in, in, uh, Kind of a constant reminder that you really have to enjoy what you're doing and have confidence. That, yeah. Um, 
what you're doing, you know, that things are going to work out because, uh, you know, it's easy to freak out as a winemaker and think, oh my God, <laughs> is this going to work out? What's happening? I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but, you really know, still have a level, you know, a level of confidence in me, so really helpful on that since I worked with Andy Erickson for a very long time um, and gained all, all some types of wisdom from him. Um, I guess perhaps the most influential would just be my father because uh, I think from him I get a really observant eye and that's mm -hmm. really the mo the best possible thing you can have as a winemaker and someone that's farming is to be patient, to be observant and to um, try and take yourself out of the process and that's yeah. that on my dad. So. Right. Okay, so follow up question then. Um, is there is there somebody and you can you can be a time traveler uh is there someone that you really wish that you could have you know worked alongside or learned from Ooh. Um, yeah that is a good question i think there's a few i mean there's a, there's a bunch of folks that i would like to go back and work with but you know, for me, one of the, my favorite things to do is to drink old California wine um, because there is such a, an interesting history here and there's such an interesting um, past and there's so much to learn from that. And I would love mm -hmm. to uh, be able to go back in time and, and work alongside uh, Andre Telechev and, and just yeah. see that transformation of Napa from um, uh, essentially, you know, nine wineries and um, very little wine being made to bring that into to what it is now. Um, yeah. I think that he would have been a fascinating person to, to learn more from and to see what it was uh, that he was doing in the vineyard uh, and also in the cellar um, would be, would yeah. be great. So, uh, I'd love to be a, a fly on the wall. <laughs> yeah, if you have the time travel thing, you let me know. Yeah, I'm working on it, working on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, these wines are absolutely beautiful. They're both um, 16s, the reds. So um, like, how would you characterize in your own words like the 16 vintage and is there a vintage that 16 reminds you of? Ooh, good question. Um, you know, 16 was uh, a year uh, that was uh, kind of a relief. There is, is it? The last year of the drought, uh, so we had um, little rain during the winter from 15 to 16, but it was uh, timed well enough that uh, growth wasn't ever a problem. Um, it also meant that the vines started to get stressed a little bit earlier in the season, and the summer fortunately wasn't terribly hot. Um, we had a heat wave, oh, about three weeks before harvest, but that was about it. The rest of the summer was, you know, up here, we sit about 1,400 feet above the, the valley floor, so we're above the inversion layer. So for us, a, a, a summer is really staying in, like, the upper 80s, low 90s at most. Um, and that's really pretty ideal uh, in terms of growing grapes in Napa. Uh, so it was a pretty dreamy summer, and the kind of the pace of the, of the growing season was also nicely metered out. Um, the harvest uh, stretched about three weeks, and that's pretty long for us because you know we grow border varieties all in the same spot. So usually, once harvest is on, it's on, and it's kind of like a two-week. Uh, it can be a two-week thing, but um, when you have a more leisurely pace to the year and a little bit kind of cooler um, harvest window, uh, it was about three weeks in length, and that that was ideal for us. Uh, awesome year in terms of or awesome vintage in terms of quality. Um, it makes me think a lot of 2013, uh, and I'd say it's almost like 2012 or 2008 combined of 2015. So there's lots of power, there's lots of intensity to the wine, but there's yeah. both eight and at least for us eight and twelve uh, had this like beautiful suaveness to them. Um, they yeah. were just always charming. They never had a, an off day. They're just kind of like friendly and. You know, anytime you pulled a sample from barrel or you pulled a cork, it was like, hey, 
How's it going? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that's so, the yeah. one, you know, it made those vintages really friendly, and it's kind of um, has that intensity, that power of 13, but also that friendliness of those two vintages. Got it. So, we have a question from home from John who wants to know what is your favorite Ovid pairing? My favorite Ovid pairing? Um, you know, the, the pairing I actually really like um, is, well, I should say with the hexameter, so the Cabernet Franc Dominant blend. I think it pairs beautifully with duck, uh, with Alfa Sabuco, um, even salmon, believe it or not. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a surprisingly versatile, uh, yeah. versatile blend in that sense, but I think duck and, and uh, or Osabuku and, and hexameter are just perfect. Absolutely love it. Um, steak and, and Ovid uh, is hard to beat, um, but you know I think it's it's fun to kind of really be imaginative about uh, what else is out there. Uh, so I like to I like to push back and, and challenge them to say, you know, dream of some uh, dream up the craziest. Right. <laughs> right. John, let us know how that goes. <laughs> Well, you've been you've been very generous with your time. It's such a uh, it's an it's a pleasure and an honor, and it's great to see you. And um, you know, one of the places that I used to see you was at um, Chamber Music, yeah. Which uh, I I uh, I miss most of uh, this last year because I was finishing my research paper for the uh, for the Master of Wine. So I can't wait to to come back. But this is sort of leads me into my my last question. So uh, for those of you at home, we have this amazing chamber music series here, which is it's, it's classical music and John Consgard, uh, John and Maggie Consgard and, and Evan over at Consgard Winery, they you know, they run it and you get these amazing world class musicians. So I, I saw you there. I, I mean, I'm assuming you must like classical music if you uh, if you go to chamber music. Um, so my question though is, um, assuming that that's true, how did you get into classical music? And then my follow-up question is, uh, what's your favorite music to listen to during harvest? Oh man. Um, so I got into classical, I mean, classical music was always something that was um, uh, around when I was growing up. My folks listened to it. Um, and I played the piano as a kid amongst other instruments. And, uh, and so I, I, mean, I distinctly remember learning three of these. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. And I was like, classic, but, um, but it, <laughs> that just really stuck with me. And, um, and so it was, uh, well, it was a few years after college that I started, uh, when I was back in Napa, I started uh, attending the chamber music series. Um, and that really kind of reignited that, that interest. Um, and so I'd say that, uh, you know, harvest music is all over the map. Um, it, it's, I tend to leave it up to everyone else because I'm a pretty, <laughs> user, I'll listen to whatever they have uh, to a degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it ranges the gamut from, uh, uh, from some old school hip hop to uh, uh, to music, I don't want to admit to to uh, <laughs> the summer safe for, space. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, if we're looking for the classic, it's usually somewhere in the last <laughs> Beethoven or Mozart or uh, Chopin. I think of yeah. those guys kind of the they're like the mega death of uh, the classical. <laughs> so, uh, if you're, you know, if you're short on sleep. During harvest, <laughs> you need something to keep you going. It's fun to have those. Um, it's not quite as, as ethereal as some, some of the other folks. So, um, yeah. I asked a, not the same question, but a similar question um, to some other folks. And yeah, it's interesting. I think it was Dan Petrosky said he could listen to anything except for reggae. And then I asked <laughs> Maya Dalavale, and she said they all they listened like exclusively to reggae. Not exclusively, they listen to a lot of reggae. So it's all over the map. <laughs> yeah, there've been harvests. We've had a lot of reggae tone, and I would say those were not the best. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone that loves it. I mean, we was fine, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it's all definitely all over the map for sure. <laughs> well, it's it's great to see you, even virtually. And these wines are 
absolutely extraordinary. Um, it's such a pleasure and 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 really a treat to to taste them and um, to hear you talk about them and get a little more insight into what you're doing and philosophy of the, of the winery. So thank you so much. Um, again, I. I'm very envious of your view, but uh, I'll uh, maybe I'll invite myself over when this is all <laughs> behind us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Austin, thank you so much. Everyone at home, thank you so much for um, joining us on the Wine Access Experience on Facebook. Uh, we will be back next week, so check in for the calendar. But uh, in the meantime, Austin, thanks again, and um, and cheers. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bye bye.